is Jenny Boyer. Uh, the lecture today is sponsored by the Lopez Library History Collections as well as the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. If you have not already done so, please sign the attendance sheet before you leave today. Our presentation today is a history of twin studies and our presenter is Charles Bocklage, PhD. He's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Bocklage has been at ECU for 33 years. So I'll turn this over to Dr. Bocklage to speak on a history of twin studies. The history of twin studies is at least two or three different stories. Uh, generally when we say twin studies, we're, we're talking about genetic twin studies. The basic idea is that we have a sample of twin pairs and we have them sorted into monozygotic, what some people call identical, and dizygotic, what people call fraternal. The idea behind it is that one kind of pairs share 100% of their genes. And the other kind of pairs shares the same average amount of genes as any other non-twin sit pair. So we try to get a big enough sample of twins to sort them into these two subsamples, monozygotic and dizygotic, and we're looking all right, to determine the extent to which genetic variation may contribute to the causes of a particular trait. We're going to pair, compare these two groups according to how similar they are with respect to the trait we're analyzing. Okay, if twin pairs that match for almost everything we can test for also tend to match for this problem or this trait, this according to all the old stories, let's go back all the way to Aristotle. Almost 2,500 years ago, almost 2,500 years ago, Aristotle didn't know anything about eggs or sperm or cells for that matter or zygotes or embryogenesis, it was almost 2,000 years before there were microscopes. Uh, we usually think of Aristotle as a philosopher. He was also the premier biologist of his day. And this was when philosopher meant love of learning and uh, any philosopher worth a piece of bread and some good Greek olive oil for breakfast was supposed to know a little bit about everything. And twins were considered, according to Aristotle, monsters. That's the same root as demonstrate, monstrosity. They were a spectacle, they were a phenomenon, they were something extraordinary. And they came from some anomaly in the interaction of seminal and menstrual fluids which generated the life principle. And it was almost like a Boyle's Law thing. He, he figured there was some kind of excess heat or pressure or something like that got involved in the interaction of those fluids. When Aristotle's work came by way of Arabic scholars into medieval Europe by way of Albert the Great and Aquinas and so on, they sort of translated this idea and blamed it on the mother. The mother had too much fun. And that caused the excess heat or pressure on the interaction of the seminal and the menstrual fluids. Caused this monstrosity, this spectacle, this phenomenon. And he noticed that there were two kinds of twin pairs. Some twin pairs were so much alike that they must be sharing a single life principle. Whatever, however, that's to happen. And the other kind were no more alike than any ordinary pair of non-twin siblings. Okay? He didn't know anything about cells or genes or anything. Sir Francis Galton, in 1875, writing on the history of twins, in a book, Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development, Galton was a polymath. He was a freaking wizard. No two ways about it. The list of his accomplishments and the ideas that he contributed to science is just incredible. And he had this basic idea. He was trying to explain how genius and greatness move through families. And 
he got this idea that twins could help him understand it. To weigh in just scales the influences of biology, heredity, versus the influences of the environment, of the way people were raised, the experiences they had. Galton didn't know anything about Mendelian genetics. Okay, he's writing eight or ten years after Mendel published what he had learned about genetics from the peas. The genetic laws of segregation and independent assortment and, and genetic factors that move in pairs. Okay. Mendel's work was already on paper at this time, had been for a few years, but it hadn't really gotten around. The word genetics didn't yet exist and Mendelian genetics would not see much progress for several decades. As I say, Francis Galton was quite a person. He was a cousin of Charles Darwin. Their family was incredible. They, they half cousin, they shared a grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, that you may have heard of. He was another polymath, incredible variety of things that he accomplished. Francis Galton became Sir Francis Galton just a couple of years before he died. He left nearly 350 papers and books. He gave us statistical concepts of correlation, regression. He invented the standard deviation, discovered it. You don't invent something like that. He was the first to apply statistical methods to studying human differences and the inheritance of intelligence and talent. He pioneered eugenics, gave it its name. He coined the phrase nature versus nurture. He was the first scientific meteorologist, psychometrician, established the use of his fingerprints as a reliable form of individual uh, identification. Uh, Mark Twain, one of his lesser known works, Puddinghead Wilson, goes at some length into the use of fingerprints. Galton supposedly conducted research on the power of prayer, concluding that it had none. He devised the first weather map. It's the first one to use isobar charts. Wrote a book, Meteorographica, that was a long time textbook in meteorology. You may have seen the bean machine. Now, I, I have seen it at the Smithsonian, one of the Smithsonian Museums, and the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. It's a board with lots of little pegs in it. And beans drop in at the top, and they clatter back and forth and sort themselves out into nice piles that provides a very close approximation to a normal distribution. By virtue of binomial distribution, as the beans are falling down, each peg they hit, they either bounce left or right. They bounce left every time you end up all the way over here. Bounce right every time you end up all the way over here. So it is a binomial distribution. At high enough number, closely approximates the normal distribution. You get the nice Gaussian bell curve. Okay, Dal Darwin didn't know mutation and natural selection. He, he didn't know the genetic basis of mutation and natural selection. He understood mutation and natural selection. That's, that's Darwin's theory of evolution. Evolution is not Darwin's theory, by the way, in case anybody wants to argue with you about it. To Darwin, evolution wasn't a theory. Evolution just means change change in species over time. And that's an observable fact and there's enormous massive data. What Darwin theorized was that this happened because of natural selection. That was his theory. Galton didn't understand the genetics of this stuff, but he had this idea. He, he had, he had uh, Aristotle's idea of uh, two different kinds of twin pairs and the ways in which they illustrated some, some, something about genetic heritability and so on. The first classic twin studies were not done until the 20s. Siemens' Die Zwillingspathology, 
twin pathology uh, is considered to be one of the first actual classic twin studies and he did what we think of as a classic twin study comparing monozygotic versus dizygotic samples of twin pairs as to how well they matched for skin moles. That was his breakthrough theoretical um, contribution. And he also contributed strongly to the theoretical foundations of Nazi racial hygiene. So he was sort of brushed aside for several decades and not very well recognized. But thousands, literally thousands, of twin studies for genetic analyses have been done. Genetic analysis, Genetic analysis is that branch of genetics where we're trying to figure out how the genetics of a thing works. Okay. Genetic counseling, we help people by helping them to understand what we've learned with our genetic analysis. Simple single gene traits can be effectively studied in simple pedigree studies. Okay. We, we look at mom and dad, we look at siblings, uh, we uh, don't need anything as complicated as twin studies for the simple single gene stuff. There's a lot of other stuff that obviously runs in families but doesn't fit a simple single gene model. And these tend to be concentrated among complex traits and they're complex uh, not only by virtue of the complex phenotype, the complex appearance of the trait, and this is especially true of behavioral traits and traits based in complex physiology. And the complex, we use that label to apply to the genotypes as well as the phenotypes. Uh, these days, most of that has settled into thinking in terms of multiple genes and environmental factors. And we call that multifactorial inheritance. Now, this particular part is a problem that's going to come up into the, what I've called for ages, the second century of twin studies, beginning about 1975, when I just started not believing what I've been told. Uh, behavior, pretty much everything you do in the way of behavior, depends upon differential function of two halves of your brain. Brain function asymmetry, handedness, motor performance, asymmetry of motor performance in your hands depends on difference in the way the brain functions on the left and the right side. The same thing with most of the emotional stuff, most of the intelligence stuff, most of the psychological stuff. Pretty much everything your brain does depends upon these asymmetries, which are established during embryogenesis as an arm missing. And twins don't do embryogenic asymmetries right. We'll get into that. Okay. So Galton's basic idea, I mean, here's where he says it, there's, there's two meanings to twins, and he modernized Aristotle's understanding. Uh, he's got the cellular basis now, and then he extends it too far. Um, the other event, due to the development of two germinal spots in the same ovum. He never really saw that, but he's thinking about it that way. In which case, they are enveloped in the same membrane and all such twins are found invariably to be of the same sex. Well, this isn't true. Not all monozygotic twins are monochorionic. Nor, as it happens, are all monochorionic twins monozygotic. And there's, uh, if you'll notice, if you go back to the flyer that Melissa sent out advertising this, this talk, there's a picture in the bottom right of a pair of conjoined twins. They're conjoined at the head and neck. And it shows them having two of everything else. Check the genitalia. They're opposite sex. According to most of what you'll hear here in the old history, that don't happen. Because 
monochorionic, monoamnionic twins, which are the only ones that can be conjoined, because if they're even diamnionic, there's a membrane between them. And if you've got a membrane between you, you can't share parts. But we'll get to that. Anyway, Galton never got the idea of the genetic basis of the differences that he noted. So we got these two kinds of twins. We got some of them be genetically identical. Some will only be uh, siblings. Um, if you're going to do a twin study, you've got to get that part right. You've got to know who's monozygotic and who's dizygotic. And an awful lot of the whole story of the history of twin studies is about getting zygosity right. Okay? And all methods of zygosity diagnosis are ver versions of the similarity method. Siemens, this was his real biggest contribution. He gave us the polysymptomatic similarity diagnosis method. The whole idea, and it's still true with the molecular mm -hmm. markers. You score a number of traits thought to be genetic. The best ones are highly polymorphic codominant markers, meaning sequences of DNA that are very, very different amongst the members of the population, come in many different versions. That's what the polymorphic part means, and codominant means when I analyze them, I see each different version. No one version overrides another, hides it on the analytical method, or and, and no one gene interferes with the function of any other gene. Okay. Monozygosity can never be considered absolutely proven. No matter how many markers I can test, and you match for all of them, there's markers out there I haven't tested yet. Okay? We now have millions, tens of millions of genetic markers that we can use for this. And no matter how many of them I test, and you match for them, there's others I haven't tested yet. So monozygosity can never be considered absolutely proven. It is stated as a probability that you're not dizygotic because I haven't found a mismatch yet. Okay, so we've got to sort the sample, monozygotic versus dizygotic, and for all the whole history of genetic twin studies, we'll leave out the opposite sex because sex as a within pair difference is just too messy. For developmental purposes, this is a big mistake, and I'll show you why later. There are certain assumptions that we just cannot get around. We have to, have to assume the MZ twins are genetically identical so that all differences between them are environmental in origin. 100% of genes in common any difference is not genetic. Dizygotic twins are equivalent to non-twin sibs. 50% of the genes in common, so some of their differences may be genetic. And we have to believe that we can accurately and reliably sort them. And we have to believe that all twins raised together share the same environment. They grew up in the same womb, grew up in the same household. All of the variation in the trait we're looking at is additive, linear, first order. That means there's no interactions. The genetic stuff is pure. Genetic and environmental factors do not interact. More than one gene involved in it, they do not interact. Their effects can be additive, but things like dominance and epistasis where, where one gene is ex one gene version is expressed regardless of what the other one is like, that's dominance, or when one gene influences the expression of another gene somewhere else, that's epistasis. Uh, certain examples, uh, coat spotting in, in dogs and mice and so on. Um, there's one gene that determines that there can be spots. 
And if that doesn't let you have spots, the other genes that make for the different number and size of spots don't matter. That's epistasis. This gene says there's no spots, no matter what these genes over here say about how big your spots are. Okay. And we have to assume we know what we're looking for. That's not just twin studies, that's science, ain't it, Joe? Ain't it, John? We have to assume that we know what we're looking for and that if it's there, we'll see it. You have to assume that. You should be aware of that assumption. <coughs> Another angle, Dalton back there said about the same membrane. We, we mentioned that before. A lot of people came to consider that that sufficed to identify a twin pair as identical without any of that similarity study rigmarole. If the twins were monochorionic, then they must be monozygotic. It's still widely believed and it is not true. The two direct studies out there, 25 years and 7,000 miles apart, one in Glasgow and one in Taipei, both found about a third of their monochorionic pairs were dizygotic. The sample of white European twins, the sample of East Asian twins. 25 years apart, the guys in Taipei were testing the use of the panel of markers that we use for forensic purposes, for purposes of identifying zygosity. And then any axe to grind out of this bucket. Okay. And it got to be, there's a lot out there or same-sex pairs are just, you just go ahead and consider them monozygotic. Twice in international meetings, I have stood and denounced from the floor somebody on the podium saying that a same-sex pair with one of these twin excess abnormalities was monozygotic. Without testing, or even in spite of discordant test results. I got a phone call while I was working on this. There's a father expecting twins. They're curious because their doctors told them, one, the ultrasound says their twins are identical. Two, the ultrasound says their twins are boy and girl. And three, amniocentesis says the girl is 45, 46XX, normal chromosomes. She has not Turner syndrome, which is pretty much the only way that actual monozygotic twins can be boy and girl. You start off with an XY embryo, one cell early in the embryo loses the Y and goes on to build a second embryo that is 45X, she is female, she's not normal, but 95% uh, of them die before birth. Once they're born, they can live a normal and useful life. Now, how can that be? How can that be? That's what this young man wanted to know. Anybody see what a problem, where a problem might be? Huh? Ultrasound, the only thing ultrasound can tell you about zygosity is that it can see a chorion. See one chorion around both twins. And everybody knows that means they're monozygotic, only that's wrong. These twins came from IVF. Boy and girl pairs are not near as common as they're supposed to be by sorting only they're more so in IVF, and it has to do with a, a thing called imprinting, a paternal X chromosome, which only girls have, slows embryogenesis. When we make artificial mouse chimeras, mixed sex, they almost all show up as normal functional males because the male cells grow so much faster in embryogenesis that the female cells get pushed down. IVF 
all the others that involve all the other artificial technologies that involve artificial induction of ovulation, they screw up the imprinting, which is something that's done while you're building the sperm and the egg. Okay. And so apparently that paternal X imprinting doesn't work like it should normally. And you get about a little over half of all the boy-girl monochorionic twins that have been discovered have come from IVF. All right, Wilhelm Weinberg. He had this, this famous difference method that's been a pillar of twin studies. Boy-girl twins are always dizygotic. Assuming sexes of twins are equally likely and independently determined by sorting X-bearing versus Y-bearing sperm. The males are XY, they make sperm, they make half of them with one X and half of them with one Y. Assuming that that is mathematically independent and so on, you would expect that twin pair conceptions would be one quarter male, one quarter female, and one half, one of each. Therefore, boy-girl twins are half of the dizygotic pairs, the other half are same sex. Therefore, Total same-sex pairs include all the monozygotic and half of the dizygotic. Therefore, the number of monozygotic pairs in any sample, it's following those rules in uh, random sample independence, the difference, monozygotic equals the same sex minus the opposite sex. So if I've got, if I'm looking at worldwide data and I'm looking at all the twins born in Germany and all the twins born in Italy and all the twins born in Nigeria, and I see how many opposite sex pairs there are. Subtract that number from the same sex pairs and I'm supposed to have a good estimate of the monozygotic pairs. That is the basis for a lot of the stories. Uh, the stories say that monozygotic twinning happens at about the same frequency all over the world. Variation in twinning frequency from one population to another all comes from dizygotic twins. All comes from those two egg twins. The older mothers have more twins. Well, that's because they ovulate twice at one time more often. Got to be. Okay. African and African-American mothers have more twins. Well, apparently they doubly ovulate more often. The monozygotic fraction, according to the Weinberg calculation, is about the same. So all that variation comes from the frequency of the opposite sex twinning. And it comes from the frequency of dizygotic twinning, which we assume is represented by the opposite sex, Two large studies, one in Belgium with the, at the Center for Human Genetics at Catholic University in Leuven, Fleeting and Robert and Katrin Duron, Percy Nylander in Nigeria, put forward these studies as proof of the validity of the Weinberg method. They use the same panel of nine genetic markers to diagnose all the same sex pairs. Given a match for all the markers used, that particular set of markers, probability of DZ could be as low as one in 50. Okay, I, could, I could tell you that I'm certain that this pair is not dizygotic at a probability of 98% because they match for all these markers. Now, the Belgians went with it like it was. Percy Nylander tested the opposite sex pairs as controls. And Percy got 25% of the opposite sex matching for all of the markers. As if they're monozygotic. So they calculated a correction. Figured that 25% of the same sex dizygotics must also have tested monozygotic. And subtracted them. According to Weinberg expectations of how many there should have been. Then the answers from the two studies matched. 
I say that makes them both wrong. They matched not being done the same way. Okay? They matched only after a very substantial recalculation. And it still buffaloes me. Now Anders in Nigeria. How do opposite sex pairs, how do dizygotic sex pairs, how do siblings, sib pairs, match more on a random basis in the most genetically diverse population on earth? You know, the out of Africa story and so on. It comes out the way it comes out because the African populations are the most genetically diverse. They have been there longer and have accumulated more mutations and more variations. But these twin pairs match at random much more than we expect them to. So that's still a puzzle. Anyway, several pillars of the twin biology depend on Weinberg method results. Fraction models, I got the same all over the world. Frequency of twinning varies entirely according to the frequency of dizygotic twinning as calculated by the Weinberg method. Therefore, DZ twinning is genetic. DZ only is genetic. There's at least race differences in double ovulation. Monozygotic is a developmental accident. We split embryos. Older women have more DZ twins. Bigger women have more DZ twins. Double ovulation, double ovulation. All this in accordance with the fraction opposite sex. I'm not gonna move. Excess developmental anomalies in twins. Everybody says it's due to the monozygotics. Why? Because monozygotics come from split embryos, which got to be screwing up the embryogenic asymmetry development. And we find more of these anomalies in same-sex pairs. Heritability is a big idea of the genetic analysis where we use twin studies and other things like that. Basically, this is an oversimplification, but it can be calculated this way. Heritability, in theory, is the fraction of phenotypic variation that is explained by Mendelian relationships. If we're looking at height or weight or something over the whole population, there's a, there's a mean and a variance. That variance is part genetic, part environmental, and the fraction of that variance, which can be explained by Mendelian relationships. Siblings have 50% genes in common, so they're going to be correlated more to the extent that this thing is genetic. Monozygotic twins share 100% of their genes, so they're going to be correlated more tightly than opposite sex, than, than dizygotic pairs. Here, for example, uh, classic autism versus autistic spectrum phenotype, you can see the influence of diagnostic heterogeneity. When we're looking at the broader autistic spectrum phenotype, we have higher heritability in both monozygotic and dizygotic twins. All around the world, there are these huge twin registries that have been assembled for the purposes of being able to get larger and <coughs> larger and larger samples of twins for twin studies. Uh, total is huge by now. We have to assume equal environment. I mentioned that just quickly once before. The co-twin control model is a variation where the unaffected co-twin is a matched control. And we set that up and consider that the differences between the twins are environmental in origin when they're monozygotic. There's no gene difference. We look for differences in environment that might explain the differences in the phenotype. Now, the second century, since about 1972, and this is where I came in. The first thing that set me off is this excess non-right-handedness in twins. 
no big deal, right? Except I told you earlier that everything your brain does depends on the fact that these two halves work differently. The twins have more non-right-handedness. Well, how come? Well, it must be the monozygotics and the splitting, right? Because they split. You split an embryo, you're bound to screw up the asymmetry determinations that are going on at the time. So all of a sudden, the left side of Susie has to become the right side of Sally. And things have to readjust. I got together 800 three-generation families, twins and all their first and second degree relatives, their grandparents, aunts and uncles, and their siblings, and handed this information on over 10,000 people. The excess of non right handedness is not just among the twins. Their siblings have virtually the same excess, who are not in general twins. Okay. Their parents, they inherit it from their parents. Each non-right-handed parent increases the probability of non-right-handed children by a factor of one and a half. So two non-right-handed parents have over twice as many non-right-handed children as two right-handed parents. There's no difference according to zygosity. We now know there's no difference according to the chorionicity, which was supposed to be a signal for late twinning. The later it was supposed to happen, the more likely it was to disturb things. There is an excess of malformations in twins and in their families. The excess is about the most common malformations, the midline fusion malformations, embryogenic asymmetry malformations, most of which involve the neural crest, which is a very special population of cells when the neural tube forms, cells right along the crest of that wave become very special and they move out and down and around and do all kinds of jobs. Neural tube defects, facial clefts, cleft lip, cleft palate, congenital heart defects, and disorders of the enteric nervous system. Again, this is not just about twins, it's also parents and single siblings, and there's no difference generally between the families of monozygotics and the families of dizygotics. The splitting is not what's doing it. Making a face, sets of teeth, constitute a marvelous subsystem model making a face, building a head. An awful lot of teeth, jaws, the face. Your face is made of about seven pieces. Two that come together here, two that come together here, one that comes down here to the nostrils. Um, all of those, in the end, your ears, your jaws, your teeth, largely determined by neural crest cells. I used a, the covariance structure of 56 dental diameters. That's a matrix of 1,596 systematically related numbers defining structural relationships in a set of teeth. Okay, highly coordinated. You've got four different basic structures of teeth. Your mouth wouldn't work nearly as well if they were randomly in there instead of cutters in front and grinders in back terrors next to the cutters discriminative function analysis provides very sensitive tests of equality of groups multivariate statistics monozygotics at one level first when i first went into it i'm mainly looking for differences between monozygotic and dizygotic and i found them with my discriminative functions, I can tell you whether an individual twin came from a monozygotic or a dizygotic pair with over 95% accuracy. That's impressive, but it turns out that those differences are very small compared to the difference between either kind of twin and singletons. For the most part, 
both kinds of twins differ from singletons by about the same distance in about the same direction. There's enough difference in direction that if I look just at that, I can tell them apart. Okay. A few other things we find there. I can tell which side of the face a set of tooth measurements came from, whether they're left or right jaw, with over 95% accuracy. Okay. In singles, not in twins. Left equals right in the twins. Probability p value comes up 98.98 that statistically they're from the same set of measurements. But there's no difference between left and right half jaw. Male difference from females in singletons and same sex twins. Over 95% discrimination. Cannot discriminate in the opposite sex twins. And the opposite sex twins are intersex. Right. So monozygotic and dizygotic embryogenesis leaves the same residuals. The MZ have to split an embryo well, the DZs are doing the same thing somehow. Okay. They have to come from a single mass of cells. Dizygotic, if there's supposed to be two eggs and two sperm, and independent ovulations, independent fertilization, independent fusions of, of uh, maternal and paternal pronuclei, independent embryogenesis, there's no reason for any difference from singleton development. But they do, every bit of it, in detail. Dizygotic twins are absolutely as odd as monozygotic twins in terms of their embryogenesis and the traces that their embryogenic oddities leave. Now, there's the whole story of chimerism. Monochorionicity does not imply monozygosity. There's a few monochorionic disease scattered in the literature. I mentioned the two studies in Scotland and Taiwan, both agreeing about one third of monochorionic pairs are dizygotic. They are by definition chimeric because they share at least that one tissue from embryogenesis. They've got a chorion that they share. So they're sharing each other's cells. Okay. Now there are people in the population, fair chance that at least one of us is one of them. They are not rare. They have two different cell lines. They are siblings, dizygotic twins in one body. They're almost all perfectly normal and found only by accident. Direct studies with extremely exquisitely sensitive fluorescent hybridization tests fluorescent uh, antibodies, 8% in a sample of dizygotic twins, 21% in a sample of dizygotic triplets, about 30% in normal women. This one is, I'm a little tenuous about that. Uh, I think, I think that tells us that something in the normal ejaculate can penetrate and leave traces. That, what? Anyway, this needs to be repeated in virgin females. But the point is they are not rare. All of those were perfectly normal. All of those found that way. Uh, one story um, got in the newspapers a few years ago, a 52 year old, Special ed teacher needed a kidney. Husband and three sons, first try. Low percentage, but if we can keep it in the family, it's better. Husband turns out to be an excellent donor prospect. The interesting thing is that two of her three sons, according to the DNA, are not her sons. They are sons of her husband and some other woman. She carried them, she delivered them, she raised them. DNA says they're not her sons. 
big flap doodle. A lot of the uh, medical talent in Boston got got upset and confused and trying to figure this out. Eventually, they found some old surgical samples frozen away, and they found the other cell line. They found a cell line in her tissue samples that was her dizygotic twin who was never born, but who was genetic mother to two of her three sons. Her cells constituted at least part of at least one of her ovaries. Okay, this is Chimera. Okay. Now, monochorionic dizygotic twins demands a single embryogenic cell mass. They had to be in a single embryogenic cell mass so that the outer layer of cells could become the chorion and enclose them both. There is no other way. So at least some dizygotic twin events happen inside a single cell mass, which is inside a single zone of elusive, that's eggshell, basically. Therefore, we're inside the substance of a single secondary oocyte. And you go back through all that other stuff, every paper that says dizygotic twins come from two eggs either just says it like it's so and everybody should know it or it'll give you a reference as authority for saying that. You go to that reference and it either says it like it's so and everybody should know or it gives you a reference. I have followed every one of those and there is no evidence anywhere that any naturally occurring pair of human twins ever came from two eggs. Now, I mentioned the discriminative functions a little bit ago. Some singletons come out scoring as twins. I told you how different twins and singletons were. A few people that went into their analysis as singletons scored as twins. No twin ever scored as singletons. Okay. And this goes back to another parallel part of the story. Most twins are not twins. Most products of twin embryogenesis are born solo. About 2% of all twin conceptions are delivered as live pairs. About three quarters of them, just like singletons, disappear entirely. The rest of the surviving one quarter get here solo usually with no evidence there was ever a twin. So there's 10 or 12 sole survivors per live birth, about one live birth and eight came from twin embryogenesis. And that's about all I got in terms of slides. I haven't closed the story for you, but I've given you a bunch of pieces that tell the story. And the only way I can make sense of it to put it together is that dizygotic twinning happens the same way monozygotic twinning happens. In a single mass of cells, you've got to lay out two patterns, two sets of body symmetries, two sets of head and tail, two sets of back and belly, two sets of left and right. There are molecules that help cells do that sort of thing in every kind of embryogenesis that we understand. To some extent, we know they're the same with humans. Now, you still have to have two sets of genetic information. And that's the hard part, but it's really not all that hard. One of the most common developmental problems that the human does is triploidy, where you have three sets of chromosomes instead of two. You can get that by having two sperm. There's supposed to be a block in the zona pellucida that stops any sperm after the first one, but it don't work all the time. Or you can have 
both of the mother's contributions stay inside the egg cell. Right? And those two happen quite enough that there's plenty around that they can happen together. Got two maternal contributions and two sperm. We get two nuclei and we develop two populations of cells. We divide those into two bodies and that dividing is rarely perfect. So most pairs of twins will share some of the other twin cells. Quite often it's pretty much one way and uh, there's no sign of the uh, mixing. I mean, chimerism can be anywhere. And I could slice you very thin and examine every slice very closely and not find the second cell line. But uh, anyway, that's a wild story. That's the history of twin studies as I understand it.